Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer. I'm the president of the London Center for Policy Research, and we have a, a special thought to action uh, with our fellow Tim Fury. Tim is a, an expert in finance and trade and all sorts of, of things that I am no expert in, so I look to people like him to actually edu educate us. Uh, if you're tuning in today, uh, welcome. Uh, please be sure and check us out on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, uh, all the different social media. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, we actually have a, a Teespring store, uh, so you can order great uh, gear regarding the London Center and support our uh, work to educate the public and be engaged on key policy issues such as what we're going to talk about today. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Tim Fury. Uh, one of our fellows who has been deeply involved in a spectrum of things. But today, he's going to be talking to us a little bit about um, uh, cryptocurrency. It's been in the news a lot. I'm no expert. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm hoping uh, our discussion today will help educate me on some of those issues. And I'm going to ask him some questions about national security implications of that. So, Tim, welcome to Thought to Action. Thank you. Great to be here again, Tony. So, Tim, uh, obviously, thank you for being part of the team. And Man, uh, this is something I don't mind saying that I, I just don't get. So um, cryptocurrency, it's been a huge issue. Uh, one of those things that government, governments want access to, well, I suspect they want access to it because they don't have access to it, and it's something they can't track. Traditionally, you've seen any number of, of governments, significant governments, uh, all the Western governments have essentially created a, a, a financial system with large banks. Uh, Theoretically, the banks are supposed to be partners, not controlled by the government. But it seems to me a lot of banks really do kowtow to governments and give them a lot of access. So let's go through that a little bit and tell us about cryptocurrency and why that's like changing the way the game is played and, and why you think that's important. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's maybe I'll start the best way is with a little bit of history on it. Sure, so, that's great. Um, when the whole world of, of cryptocurrency basically uh, came about, and I, although there was some work before Bitcoin, I think the, 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 the beginning of Bitcoin itself, or when the white paper um, for that particular project came out, um, that was kind of the beginning of cryptocurrency as we know mm -hmm. it in the modern era. Now, um, when that white paper came out, that was in, I believe it was the end of October of 2008. Now, what was going on then? Is we, there was huge worries about inflationary pre pressure that was coming from governments, sovereigns who were printing massive amounts of currency, right. or, or is often called a, a, a fiat. And so there was this worry that even in the U.S., um, where which has always been seen as, or for a long time, been seen as the you know the stable economic you know center of the world. Even there, you couldn't trust the dollar, right? So right. how do you create a currency that's based on something other than politicians just turning on and off the, 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 the money spigot? And right. so the idea behind um, uh, Bitcoin was to create an actual currency that was based on algorithmic production or algorithmic increases of supply that was not uh, controlled by any kind of government, right? So right. just by design, government intervention is supposed to be kept out of not only Bitcoin, but everything to, to move forward. And, and partially, and of course, this is secured by all kinds of um, very complicated cryptography, uh, which creates a system where this can happen outside the control of a third party, right? So there's not only no government involved, there's no Citibank, there's no JP Morgan, there's no central company or entity keeping a record of who has what, who owns what, who's printing what. There's just this one um, central, this one deposit, uh, depository of information, right? Of, of data that keeps changing over time. And so as it grows over time, this is why it's called a blockchain because it's just one continuous string of data. And that string is, is maintained by operators throughout the world, network participants who do all kinds of complicated um, uh, computations that wind up um, building every block of data. So every time I send you a Bitcoin transaction that would go into the next block, mm -hmm. and then that's added to the next block, and that's added to the next block. And so that goes on, you know, in theory, um, you know, in infinite amount of time, and all of the transactions that's ever happened uh, are recorded on that blockchain. So that's how it all comes, comes about. And, and what's interesting now, because 
And we'll go through probably the reasons why um, crypto has been in the news lately is one of them is, is inflation, right? Yeah. And so right. inflationary press, pressures is what, what got this all started. But it's also what's going on right now where we're seeing massive inflation over the past year. And this has been one of the things that's now started to drive a lot of the values of Bitcoin and, and other like, um, like currencies uh, up in value. Um, and, and one other thing I'd like to say, so we, we talked a lot about Bitcoin because Bitcoin mm -hmm. was originally the, you know, the, the genesis block when it comes to the cryptocurrencies and it was a cryptocurrency. It was meant by its founders to be something that you would go buy your coffee with, with, at Starbucks with, right? A replacement for the dollar, the yen or, or whatever fiats are out there. But there are most of the other tokens out there. And at this point, as I think in 2022, over 10,000 of these things are, are not really meant to be currencies in the, in, in the way that you would you know, buy something with. Um, they're meant to be you know, tokens that are used in decentralized networks, similarly to when you go out and you buy a laundry token, right? You go mm -hmm. to a laundromat and buy a laundry token, that token is used within that laundry network, right? Right. So what I'm talking about, I think what we'll talk about on the, you know, for the subject of this call is looking at, let's say, Bitcoin and some of the others that are used as kind of a currency, a store of value, um, and use and, and focus on, on that because there is a whole lot out there and it is it does get very confusing. And there's a lot of bad terminology that just shouldn't be there and just confuses everybody. Well, I, I think it's true. So I guess a biological analogy of what you're talking about, DNA, basically, when, when DNA replicates, a copy of that goes, goes I mean, it's, it's, it's simply added to, it does, it does not change, I mean, per se, you, it, it adds. So that's what a blockchain is, essentially. It's like a, a, or a non-organic uh, uh, record that keeps Correct. growing. Okay. Bigger and bigger over time. It's bigger. So time. good. That's good to understand. So that's good. Now, um, one of the things about, Fiat currencies is obviously the link between banks and governance. Uh, and uh, I've been doing as uh, pre preparing for this interview and trying to educate myself. I did a little review uh, of uh, the German Republic, the German uh, pre World War II, the Weimar Republic, and uh, how the the National Bank, the Federated Bank of Germany, apparently I don't remember the exact name, was able to basically base currency on one of two things the good faith and credit of the German uh, nation and gold. You could actually buy marks, which were either based uh, based on either. You could, you could at, at some point in time, buy marks that would be essentially traded for gold, which the government said, yeah, we don't want to have those out there. They encourage people to give them up. But there was something tangible tied to that currency at, at that point. To that, to that as a com as a commodity, maybe I don't know if it's a commodity or not, but it was something that people used for exchange. And same with the fiat mark, the the idea that faith and credit were behind it. How does this change? How does this change the idea that you don't have? What's the faith and credit behind this? How, how do you have faith in it? And um, a second to that. Uh, are banks going to be able to get into this? Because I see uh, there's a, like a credit card out now by some companies saying, oh, it's based by, by Bitcoin or crypto. So uh, they, they, it seems like they're trying to get in the game now too, the big, big banks, so. Got it. So I think the question comes down to what you mean by faith, right? So for instance, the, you know, the yeah. dollar has, you know, it's um, preeminence because it has the full faith and credit of the US government. You can use it. Theoretically, yes, that's for, what they said. For all, for all um, purchases domestically, you can pay your taxes with it, all things like that, right? So yeah. now, Bitcoin, um, um, and let's say for cryptocurrencies, I'll use Bitcoin um, as you know the primary subject of what I'm talking about. True, it it does not have a government, um, you know, something as strong as the U.S. government backing of giving it credibility, right? It only has credibility in that the users give it value, and mm -hmm. as that network grows, as more people use it, as more people believe in it you know, as they build it, they will come type deal where people with the value of it will increase. Now, the other side of faith is how do you have faith that, you know, you won't have inflationary printing take right. your money down to zero. So let's assume- Yeah, because they do that with fiat currencies all the time. Exactly. So you're right. The, the Federal Reserve can go out and, 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 and print tons of, 
tons of dollars. Well, that was my point about bringing Germany up. Germany just literally, despite uh, that's why they wanted the gold based uh, marks back. We don't want that. We want to be able to print and print and print, which then devalues individual uh, uh, power by the fact that they lower the value of the money you've saved. As a matter of fact, it, it takes savings away, it basically destroys it. Right. And that's, and that's what the real engine behind Bitcoin was meant to solve for, because it was designed to have a, a, a very gradual and very fixed curve, supply curve with regards to how many Bitcoins were issued based on how much volume the, the network rose by. Right. So in, and so it's just kind of a, a, a formula that goes over time until it hits 21 million uh, Bitcoin. And then that's it. That's the total supply that will ever be minted um, minus the, the number of coins that have been lost, people who have lost their keys. Um, just a little bit into that. So the way Bitcoin works, it's unlike other assets. So if you have gold, if you have dollars, you have it in your pocket, in right. uh, you know, your house, in your bank account, your trading account, whatever. With, with regards to Bitcoin, for instance, you don't actually ever own a Bitcoin. All the Bitcoins think of it as staying on that chain. You own a passcode that accesses your Bitcoins, right? So some people, especially some of the early folks, actually lost their, their, their key. They threw out the computer, the piece of paper that the key was written on got thrown away. And so wow. you'll have 21 million minus that amount that was lost. And that's the extent of the supply you'll ever have. So a lot of people look to the value of Bitcoin is as the, you know, the population grows, as more people find out about it, as more people believe in it. On top of that, having a fixed supply that the the value of it will continue to go up over time. And one of the things that was one of my favorite lines that was said to me is, it's, it's not that Bitcoin's so great, it's that the dollar's so bad. And yeah. if you had Bitcoin, the dollar over the past, you know, you know, few decades, you would, you would have lost, you know, 90 something percent of your investment, depending on the time frame, right? Because the dollar just goes down over time. So, I mean, again, if you, hold a pot of dollars and then you think you're going to just go into retirement in that, uh, you know, as a young person, you are going to be sadly disappointed by what you're left with because just. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Look, uh, I understand from uh, the time I moved, I started Washington. I started working in Washington in uh, uh, full time in 1988. And I was making 23,000 a year. Now it wasn't bad money in 1988. I don't know how much you could do with $23,000 a day. If you had to start out, it would be almost impractical. To do so. And I think it's been because of the last 20, 30 years. How many long? Boy, that time flies. 30 some years, 40 years. Although I, think uh, they still, I, I, I still think they, they pay Hill staffers that. So <laughs> Yeah, I think they do. But that's the point. It's like it's been badly devalued by the, the, the policies of not just the, the not just the Federal Reserve, all large federated banks from it, from the looks of it. So what are you saying? So, Tim, are you saying you could hedge? Uh, inflation to a great degree, if you're able to get into the Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency uh, holding uh, well, a system? Well, that's one of the beliefs. The asset class in itself, Bitcoin's only been around for about 13 years now. Mm -hmm. So initially it was it was seen as, as a hedge to all these things, right? For that very reason that, you know, the, the supply dynamics of Bitcoin isn't going to change. So if all of a sudden you see the printing of dollars explode, that you should get a relative uh, appreciation in Bitcoin versus the dollar. So, right. But given that it's only been around for 13 years, there's still those dynamics of the correlation behind it are still being worked out. Um, oddly enough, it's, it, it seems that almost, you know, in, in the last year or so, you know, the value as, as let's say the market moves, that's kind of, you know, Bitcoin and some of the other cryptocurrencies have kind of been moving more in tandem with market movements than they had in the past. Now, yeah. that's just something a dynamic that's short term or, or a longer tail in nature. We're, we're not quite sure yet, but in theory, um, you know, there should be a as inflation of the dollar or other fiats increases, there should be an appreciation of, of, of Bitcoin as a hedge against that. So uh, I have two more questions for you. First has to do with the security of the coin itself, because uh, one of the things that came up during the trucker protests in Canada was that uh, the Canadian government was demanding access to people's Bitcoin wallets, whatever you want to call it. Uh, wow. I mean, it seems to me that part of the reason they want to do this is because they want control. So 
How secure is this from the government per se? Do you, or can you make an assessment of that? Sure. So that goes into one of the other big, um, you know, use cases, a reason why crypto has now become so, at least the past uh, few weeks, so so talked about in the news media, um, is the fact that you look at, let's say, the the, the trucker protests, mm-hmm. which you know was for those that, that are, may not be familiar with it, was a a protest um, in Ottawa around the the Canadian government, uh, primarily by truckers who really kind of did a peaceful protest using their trucks um, and other implements to try to really shut down the government to have their issues addressed. Right. And about 18 days into it, uh, with no violence or anything like that, um, Prime Minister Trudeau decided to um, evoke the Emergency Measures Act, which hadn't been evoked since, ironically enough, his father had done it, had done it years back uh, against the violent um, separatist groups in Quebec who were actually committing acts of violence, right? Mm-hmm. And as, Part of this, what they did was they tried to shut down, uh, and this may have actually started even before the Emergency Act, um, shut down any of the truckers' access to donations, to their own bank accounts that they had, and anything like that. So, you know, the the Canadian government went out to everybody and said, look, you you need to shut down these accounts. And they went out to a lot of the, some of the um, crypto-related companies and said the same thing. And they were responded with, listen, these are self-custodied accounts, meaning individuals hold access to their own keys and thus their own coins. And so we don't have any access to that. We can't do anything about it. And so right. for the time, the only resources that you could get to these truckers, these activists, was uh, via digital assets. Uh, because you can send it from your direct wallet to their wallet without any intermediary between. Now, you can set up intermediaries between Coinbase, Gemini, other like hot wallet structures, but you don't necessarily have to. The network allows you to go from point A to point B directly and probably quicker than any other system that actually has intermediates. I could send $10 million worth of Bitcoin to somebody in Japan um, you know, in a matter of minutes versus what that would take in the standard modern. Right. So that really would... Uh put a dent in banking by the fact that uh, banks do make money off transactions. Uh, obviously, they make money off interest of holding uh, the money for a certain amount of time. So this could really threaten their business model. Is, am I co- interpreting that correctly, Tim? Definitely. And a lot of, and a lot of banks, for instance, JP Morgan uh, is one that's uh, notable, is, is, is looking at ways that they can actually use this technology internally to actually then benefit from, from these kind of services where you can have you know, an internal what's called a walled garden system mm-hmm. where they can then have um, direct transfers within their network that is at a fraction of the time and cost. So these are things that have been explored by traditional banks. And I think if traditional banks are, are not necessarily looking to, let's say, subvert this new system as they were a few years ago, but looking at how way, uh, look at the ways that they can become a part of it and profit from it. Well, profit obviously is a big thing for banks, but for my point of view in this context is being able to protect any transaction from government interference. Clearly, that is something that seemed to have come through in this Ottawa Canadian model is that uh, basically anybody who had Bitcoin really wasn't, uh, they were not troubled by the Canadian government. Is that a fair assessment of, of what the outcome was? For the most part, I mean, what was scary about it is, um, and one of the things, one of the other innovation that's been talked about is something called a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. So should the Federal Reserve Bank create a digital dollar? Should we have Mm -hmm. a digital euro Uh, and things like that? Um, So this is hotly debated, but one of the things that come out of the Canadian trucker issue is if you had a CBDC, well, then the government authorities could turn that off just the same way. Right. So can, you, can you imagine if, let's say, you have, let's say, the Black Lives Matter protests where the government can just shut down all their money and not just, let's say, donations of money to them, but like shut down their actual money, right? right. Like you, if you have a wallet full of dollars or, or whatever, and anything you may have on you, you could spend that. But what if somebody actually, you know, you, you went to a vendor to, you know, store to use your dollars and they said those dollars aren't valid. So this is one of the things where a lot of the folks in the, you know, the, you know, the traditional crypto world of, of, of Bitcoin and some of the other uh, cryptocurrencies are like, look, CBDCs may be a nice idea, but they still now create this fundamentally new problem 
of censorship and, and you don't know where that goes because again these canadian truckers were not committing any acts of violence at least nope. that i'm aware of this was as peaceful as you can get and the canadian government went out of their way to make sure that they couldn't get access to any resources especially when they needed it for fuel food and other things during a during a rather cold winter as i understand it yeah well and that's where i think um my next question is related to that is like, how, how do you then buy crypto for someone like me who has no background in it? And then access to uh, and be able to come back on the internet and find access to it again. So those, it's related. So how would I do that if I wanted to jump into it? So I think the easiest way is, and especially if you're in the U.S., there's, um, let's say, Coinbase or Gemini, where, you know, they're kind of intermediary trading platforms. So they allow you to do what's called like an on-ramp, right? An on-ramp is where you can take your dollars, go right from your bank account to the, um, to the, to the, to the Coinbase, let's say, we're, if we're using them, and then you could use their market to buy whatever it is that you want and then hold it in what's called a hot wall. So you're basically holding it within their system. Now, mm. there's other ways you can, there's, uh, there's a lot of books that I, I can recommend, things like that, or YouTube videos that discuss, let's say, wallet hygiene and things like that. And as you learn more, you can then get what's, let's say, called a cold wallet, which may be a piece of hardware that you stick in your device that you can download your, your keys to, or you, know, you can figure out how you can just literally take out, you, you know, write down your keys take that, put it in a safe depositor or things like that where you basically go cold on it where it almost becomes similar to a bearer asset, right? So as right. long as you that key secure, you own the, the access to the, to the tokens and, and nobody else can take them from you, right? You, if you have you know, this piece of paper with your codes and it's in a safe place, you, you don't have to worry about being hacked. Where if you're using a centralized um, service like Coinbase, Gemini or anything else, that could theoretically be, be hacked in the same way that, let's say, a bank can be broken into. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's one way to, to go about it. And, and as you become more comfortable, because again, it doesn't quite have the same user interface than, let's say, your, your Chase account. Uh, I was going to say, do you see this becoming a routine where you go to the 7-Eleven and you use Bitcoin of some sort to buy a, a Slurpee or something? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just asking Absolutely. What you think? More, more and more, um, come, for instance, PayPal actually is another way you can get into it as well. I don't know why I didn't throw that one out because so many people have PayPal accounts. You can right. now, through your normal um, PayPal interface, go in and out of Bitcoin, Ethereum, or, or various other, um, other tokens. Again, you're still using their system, so you're still kind of dependent on a, in a, in a hot wallet situation. But then you can pull those those tokens outside into your own wallet and then be completely secure um, with you. Now, although Bitcoin was originally intended to be used to, to go to 7-Eleven and buy your coffee, it's become more of instead of a digital dollar, more of a digital gold, so to speak. Right. People are kind of getting it, hoarding it, hoarding it, holding it long. Um, with the expectation that over time, much like gold, it'll be an inflationary hedge, it'll increase in value and things of that nature. So although you do have people that are buying good services with it, it's not really the day-to-day -day operation, you know, operating device for that, the way that you would use your credit card. Now also keep in mind that we're talking about this from a U.S. perspective, right? Where, again, you have your credit card that you can go out and not only make purchases pretty easily, but you can get airline points, cash back, all these other things. But in a right. lot of, m much of the rest of the world, you know, you go to Africa, you go to Latin America, where you really have to worry about you waking up and, you know, with the, your, 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 your local currency being worth something and then being worth something else. Oh, yeah. No, I get that. Or being able to buy things or send money. That's where a lot of these technologies really add quite a bit of value. Well, it's interesting you should mention PayPal. I was just sitting here, I just went through and I did a screen in my email. Uh, they've offered me $5 in cryptocurrency if I sign up for their credit card. So that's interesting. So. Exactly. There's, there's a learning curve that, this, that, that comes up with it. And 
and obviously you never this thing this obviously good hygiene with it you never give anybody your keys you never send that you know this there's, yeah. there's, there's scams and things out there it's it's good to educate yourself do it on small dollar amounts be comfortable with it um and then you can go go from there but you're right a lot of the the user interface for this stuff because again there's no intermediaries involved there's no there's no customer service group that you can call and speak to if you're just let's say custodying your your bitcoin tokens yourself because there's nobody else out there right it's just it's just this protocol that's producing these tokens and then the participants trading them back and forth there's no central authority so you're right you don't have to worry about some you know government inflating the currency but again you also don't have anybody to call to fix something so it's right it's a double-edged sword it is a trade-off yeah so well some of us obviously because i do have a retirement i'll be getting from the federal government will be re receiving that. But I guess uh, the idea would be is that if with sufficient intelligence, you could figure out a way to off-ramp your fiat currency and, and on-ramp to a number of digital strategies. Is that is that something I think most part people may start thinking about doing? Actually, the um, the most famous person doing it right now is uh, Mayor Adams of New York City. He's- uh, uh, I, I, Yes, I saw that, yeah. He now, now he now still under federal law, you still have to be paid in, in dollars, right? So there's, mm -hmm. you can't just get- paid in Bitcoin. So what he does is he gets his dollars in as part of his salary and then converts that over. I don't think it's, I don't think it's prudent for people to keep all of their, um, uh, you know, their, their retirement savings in, in, in this type of instrument. Obviously diversity is key, but I think part of the portfolio probably should be at least some of the more, you know, quote unquote, trustworthy uh, digital assets such as Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's at this point, 10,000 of these things that are part of thousands of projects. And people ask me all the time, which ones I would buy. I mean, so many of them are, you know, things are- Dogecoin, Do Dogecoin, I've seen that Yeah, I mean, Doge, Dogecoin is a great example of-, of that, was, that was- That was like the original joke coin that took off to be a multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, market. Apparently. I mean, but, but so there's a lot of that stuff I personally wouldn't touch. I think if you go with Bitcoin, Ethereum, you're probably pretty safe to basically ride the growth in the overall market. Um, the, the total value of this asset class hit about $2 trillion today. If Bitcoin Jesus. went back up 44,000. Wow. And part of it, we talk about the other aspect in the news is uh, now we talked about how it was used as a avenue of good with regard to the Canadian truckers and basically helping facilitate right. and keeping right. democracy and peaceful protests going. We look at now the currency, the, the worry in, let's say out of the EU commission, is that Russia will be using access to digital assets as a way to subvert a lot of the same. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. So it seems to me a, a valid way for Putin to get around all these so-called restrictions and and other things that they've been trying to put on him. It seems to me he knew they were coming for, for his money. So this seems to me a good strategy to, to bypass or overwhelm or uh, prevent those penalties from act, actually having any lasting or significant effect on them. It could be. And, and they've seen where a lot of because so much of this is transparent, right? This is all, right. you know, access to the blockchain is something that if you know what you're doing, you can go on and see all the movements, right? Like you can't, you can't see what's going on in, in, in people's city banks, city bank accounts, but you can do that within, within blockchain. And, and there's been a, there was been a lot of action of Russian clients who were moving uh, Interesting. assets over into another, um, it's like a, basically a digital dollar called Tether mm -hmm. um, in the run-up to, to the invasion. Now, I think that the, the damage to the, the Russian economy is just so massive that there's no way that, that crypto would be able to, you know, fully, um, you know, buffer that, you know, you know take the place of, of the economic, um, you know, value that they've lost. But there'll be, I guarantee you, there'll be certain way, um, ways that they, um, you know, move uh, assets in and out through those networks. Well, ironically enough, uh, back in late January, the Duma was discussing how they need to, about potentially banning all of crypto across Russia mm. because it damaged the monetary policy integrity of the nation. I bet they're really regretting saying that now. I'm sure. Well, you know, obviously, when you're invading other countries and trying to do things which upset the the monetary system. With that said, uh, Tim, I don't see him doing uh, the West doing uh, all that much against 
their hardest asset, which is oil. I mean, look, uh, according to the, the information I got today, we're still, the United States is buying Russian oil, uh, which I think is like, are you kidding me? Uh, the Germans are a partner, a partner in distribution of all the energy coming out of Europe. Nobody seems to actually be willing to do the hard things to really put a kibosh in, in the oil thing because people need it. And it's like, yeah, we want to cut Putin off, but uh, yeah, we want that oil to be, be flowing because we need it. So it's, it's an interesting dilemma, probably outside the scope of our discussion today. But it relates back to the fact that I think Russia is going to continue to be able to produce or receive hard currency, hard fiat currency to sustain at least some of the economy because, you know, people are going to be buying their oil. So, uh, Absolutely. And I'm, I'm no expert on the energy markets either, but I do find it rather strange that, you know, U.S. government approvals were given for, you know, pipelines over, over yep. Europe for that oil, but yet weren't approved for, you know, domestically. Right. Yeah. All, I, all political. Yeah. So, well, Tim, thank you for explaining us today uh, this issue. I think um, uh, obviously the cryptocurrency market is going to continue to expand, to grow. Uh, I, I know I definitely want to try to understand it better. I appreciate your giving us a, a, a layman understanding of what it is. Anything else you think we ought to look for regarding this before we go? Anything else you'd recommend we, we watch as this develops? I'd also look at, you know, we talk about Russia and them using it for, um, you know, purposes of, bad, of evil. There's also a massive effort going on in getting, using digital assets to fund the Ukrainian resistance effort. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, that's I good. About last I saw today, about $26 million has been gathered through um, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and various other um, digital asset contributions. And I understand that over half of that has already been deployed into hardware. Wow. Uh, usage. So if you look at the speed with regards to, you know, how you can, you know, push the button on setting the transaction to how fast it can be turned into, let's say, life-saving medical work or, or hardware to defend the Kiev, that's pretty amazing. Wow. Well, that's really interesting. Well, again, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Fury, a uh, fellow f with the London Center for Policy Research and obviously a great expert on all this digital currency, where it's going, where it came from and what we can expect. Tim, we're going to have you back on and, and probably not, not too distant in the future to talk more about this because, uh, man, uh, we old fogies have no idea about this. So it's it's important for you to tell to be, be able to instruct us on what's actually going on. And thank you all today for joining us for Thought to Action, uh, where we delve deeply into policy er areas like this and, and others. If you enjoyed the content today, please like, share, subscribe, be sure and comment, uh, follow us on uh, Getter. Uh, Rumble, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all the different things. And obviously, uh, we have a store, like I mentioned, the Teespring store. You can buy our, our, our kit and our gear. Uh, and we have more exciting stuff coming to that very soon. So uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer. And uh, thanks again for joining us for Thought to Action.